Hello and welcome to the Sweater Weather Podcast. This is episode six. My name is Pamela. A very warm welcome to any new or returning viewers. I am coming to you from Northern Ontario, Canada, where I live with my husband, my youngest daughter, and my dog, Molly. This is a podcast mainly about knitting and other creative pursuits. So grab a cozy beverage and your favorite craft project and let's get started. I'm drinking a tea today. And this is a chocolate and hazelnut tea from Stash Teas. It doesn't have um, bits of chocolate or nuts in it like um, David's tea does. It's in a bag. So it's just a flavored decaffeinated tea. Um, but it tastes like a dessert. So when you add a little bit of milk to it, <laughs> It really is like a creamy dessert and it's extremely delicious. I could drink this all day long. I usually don't. I usually save it as a treat for later in the day, but I thought I would have one uh, as I get together with my virtual friends to discuss knitting. I'm sorry if... Uh, the camera is picking up that slurping noise. Maybe I'm enjoying it a little bit too much. So today I have several finished objects to talk to you about. I'm really excited to share those with you. I have one whip. I have a few non yarn related acquisitions to share just a couple. And I also have um, a project that I'm going to cast on probably today or tomorrow that I I wanted to talk to you about as well. So starting with my first finished object, it's the one I'm wearing. It's so nice and cozy. I'm so happy I finished it. This is a project that I started in, um, I think it was November of 2021. So not that long ago, it was late, late last year. It was part of a knit along that was hosted by the Woolen Waves knitting online knitting store. I did not obviously finish the project <laughs> at the end of the knit along. I actually got distracted and moved on to other things. I had completely finished the yoke part of it. So the fun color work part of it was completed, but I hadn't uh, I had just split for sleeves and I put it down and I didn't pick it back up till now. So anyways, I completed this beautiful woolly sweater just in time for summer. <laughs> in case you don't recognize the sweater, it is the Cordy sweater. The designers are Kiyomi and Sashiko Birkin. Um, and this pattern was in the book Moon and Turtle. So I did purchase the digital version of the book. There are a few other items in the book that I do hope to knit in the future. There's a beautiful shawl. Uh, the name escapes me. But I will insert a picture and I will, um, put the name down below, but I, it, it looks like a really nice shawl that uh, I am interested in doing. And there's a regular version 
I can't remember if it's a DK. And then there's a, a, a complete mohair, mohair version of the shawl as well. So that's interesting to me. So the sweater, the original design of the sweater, the, the, um, the design was in peace fleece. So I wanted to knit the sweater in the same yarn that the original was completed in. So I did purchase peace fleece, um, which is a worsted weight yarn. It is 75% 75% Navajo Rambouillet and 25% mohair. So you get 200, 200 yards per 100 gram skein. So this main color right here is Father's Gray. And I'm going to try and hold it up closer to the camera just so you can see all the variations of gray it's a beautiful gray it's got little flecks of white it's got some flecks of almost black and then many like subtle subtle variations of the gray itself um the black part it which is um the the uh, neckband and in the yoke is baku black the white is not a pure white it's more of a creamy white and it's called antarctic white and then my original plan was to include a teal color of peace fleece in the yoke as well however um the tone of that teal when i changed the colors of the yarn to black and white it it just blended too much it didn't stand out so i felt like the tone was too close even though the color was absolutely beautiful so what i decided to do instead was i added in two um colors of let lopi so i don't actually know the the color names or if there are even are color names but um, the, this gold is uh, is Texlet Lopi, which is a, another worsted weight yarn, and the magenta. Also. So because I was adding in two additional colors, I actually changed the color placement of the original design. So that was one of the modifications that I did do. Um, the one thing that I didn't change, and I I would if I were to knit this sweater again, and I would knit this sweater again. Um, I would not change these black and white striped diamond motif. I think that the black and, and these upside down triangles, to me, the black and white stripes are what modernizes the color work of the Cordy sweater. And they're, they are like the highlight of the sweater. So to me, that's one thing that I, I wouldn't change. Perhaps... If I would put another dark color with the white, but I really think the black and white is the showstopper of the sweater and what makes it really stand out. So to me, I, I would personally, I would keep that even if I were to knit it again. I knit the sweater on the recommended needle size, except for the neckband. I really, I dropped down two or three needle sizes for the neckband because I really wanted it to be um, very tight, but stretchy. So I wanted it to have a certain look. And the only way I really felt like I could achieve that look was to really drop it down a, a few needle sizes. What I did find doing that though was it was extremely hard on my hands um, to knit such a thick wool with small that small of needles was really difficult and and uh, so the ribbing on the yoke the cuffs and the bottom is my favorite kind of ribbing which is two by two. Oh. A little piece of vegetable matter. So I did find quite a bit of vegetable matter in the peace fleece. 
and to me that's like a happy little surprise whenever i find the vegetable matter it always reminds me uh that this fiber used to be on a an animal which is like cool that's just really cool so i knit the sweater on the recommended needle size but i didn't gauge swatch which I think I should have done because I tend to be a, a really loose knitter. And in some cases that really works to my benefit because for example, the yoke of the sweater did not have any type of puckering. I felt that it was really laid nice and flat. And I think that is a um, positive outcome of me be being a loose knitter. But by the same token, um, when you're a loose knitter, you run into other issues such as having garments that are too large or um, run potentially even running out of yarn if you're close. So I knit the size five, which is for a 50 inch chest. I do not have a 50 inch chest. I have a 44 inch bust. The sweater is recommended to have four inches of positive ease, which would put me at a um, size 48, but that was in between the two sizes. So I either had the option of choosing a 46 inch bust or a 50 inch bust. And I am always nervous that the garments that I make are going to end up being too small and I won't be able to wear them. I'd much prefer having a very large oversized garment, especially with this type of sweater, which tends to be uh, like it's very um, cozy and relaxing and, and not meant to be tight or fitted. So I went with the 50 inch, um, 50 inch size, which was the size five, but really I could have knit a much smaller size so I'm going to insert pictures I have a lot of positive ease and I will insert pictures um it's knit to my exact perfect length that I wanted and I think I have to thank barber cords for that um the barber cords are a game changer in my book being able to just stick those on and try on the garment at any point allows you to get the exact right length of the garment, the exact right sleeve length that you want. Total game changer. Whether you use Barber Cords um, or any other brand or even the generic pony cord that you can get at your local craft store for for much less, I do have some of that as well. And then you can just cut it. Um, game changer. If you don't have barber cords or something similar and you knit in the round, please get yourself some. It's a, it's a life changer, it's a game changer. I cannot stress that enough. So despite the fact that the, the sweater turned out a little bit bigger than what I wanted, I still love it. It's so cozy. There was one morning where I, the house hadn't warmed up yet. The, the furnace had turned on in the morning. We turn our furnace off at night to um, save energy and it's automatically set to turn on in the morning when we get up. And the sweater, the furnace had turned on, but the house hadn't warmed up yet. And I was getting ready to start the second sleeve. So I wanted to make sure that this, <clears throat> I wanted to make sure that the other sleeve was the right length before I bound off. When I put the sweater on and tried it on, it was so cozy that even though I didn't have one sleeve, I didn't want to take it off. It was so nice. I just can't get over 
I would use Peace Fleece again in a second. So, um, before I talk about blocking, um, I just want to mention that I, so before I talk about blocking, uh, just a couple of things, I just want to mention that I did not go up a needle size for the yoke as some people do. Um, again, I'm a loose knitter, so I didn't have an issue with knitting the, the color work. Um, there was no puckering or anything of, like that. I did not knit the color work into hands because I can't do that yet. Maybe I should try. I didn't knit the color work with two hands. I was picking up one color, putting it down, picking up the other color and putting it down. So the way that I picked the dominant color that I wanted when I was knitting the color work was I would make sure that that yarn traveled underneath the other color. Um, and that's really the only way I know how to explain it. My apologies if that doesn't make sense. I know if you if you knit two, if you can knit two colors at a time, your dominant color should be in your left hand. The one closest to your heart is how they say it. But from my understanding, um, if you if you don't knit with two hands like that, or even one hand with multiple yarn, um, and you have to drop and pick up the yarn, you just need to make sure that the dominant colors travels on the Travel. <laughs> you just need to make sure that the dominant yarn travels on the bottom. That's my understanding. That's how I did it. I will insert pictures of my floats um, on the on the back side because I'm kind of proud of them. I think they're they turned out really really nicely. Um, there aren't too many places in the pattern where you need to um, cross your floats. Uh, down here you can see actually let me just lift this up down here um, there's more than five stitches so I would have um, definitely picked up the floats there just remember there are a few times not that many where you have to pick up your floats so it was nice not to have to do that very much I like uh, I definitely enjoyed the pattern um one thing that I was trying to do because I really when I knit when I knit my love note sweater one thing that made me kind of crazy I didn't rip it out I left it but one thing that kind of made me crazy is the way my ribbing on the cuffs the neck band and the bottom part of the sweater the ribbing looked really uneven. The knit stitches looked wonky and distorted and the purl stitches looked really wide and airy. They didn't look neat at all and I was really unhappy with the way it looked. So I kind of went on a mission to try and fix that issue and I, I believe I have, but what that means is it takes me a lot longer to knit my ribbing. So what I do, um, it's probably no surprise, the first part is uh, for the knit stitches, I do twisted. So I, I do twisted knit stitches, so I knit through the back loop for the, for the knit stitches. And then what I learned why my purl stitches look so wonky is because when you're knitting, and most of you probably already know this, and I'm a little late to the party on this, but when you're knitting, if you have a purl stitch after a knit stitches, like in ribbing, that is the longest distance that yarn has to travel from a knit stitch to a purl stitch because it comes from the back, comes to the front, and then wraps around, it's a lot of yarn. And what ends up happening is that that purl stitch looks 
bigger than the other stitches. That first purl stitch after the two after the knit stitch and ribbing looks bigger because it is bigger because there's more yarn there. And that's what I was noticing and obsessing over. Um, I really did not like that. So in order to straighten out my knit stitches, I'm knitting through the back loop. And then in order to make my purl stitches nice and neat, what I'm doing is I'm wrapping the yarn the wrong way around the needle to do my first purl stitch after the knit stitch. And what that means is as I knit around, when I come back to that stitch, it's twisted on the needles. I have to take it off put it back on the needles the correct way, knit another purl stitch incorrectly by wrapping it the wrong way, keep going, and then when I get back to it, I have to turn it around. So I'm doing that for each purl stitch after knit stitch. I really love the way it, how neat it looks. So I'm going to try and hold this up so that you can see it. And then uh, for the bind off, I just bind off in pattern because I find that that's nice and stretchy, but it also looks really nice and straight and nice and neat. So um, I tried, <laughs> I had been watching videos and I had tried um, an Italian bind off on another sweater I had made um, a while back, last year sometime or maybe earlier than that. And I found it it flared out. So I really didn't like the Italian bind off. I'm it might not be anything special, but for me just binding off in pattern really makes a nice clean look and I'm for now anyways I'm happy with that. I've never done a tubular bind off. Um and so maybe sometime in the future when one of the patterns I try calls for it, I'll give it a shot. But for now, just binding off in pattern uh I'm completely happy with that. This is too good. So the other thing I wanted to mention is that when I was knitting the color work with the Peace Fleece and the Let Lopi, the Let Lopi looked different in the color work. It looked thinner to me, even though both of them were classified as worsted weight. Definitely the piece fleece is a lot softer. I'm sure that's because of the, or I feel confident that it's because of the mohair content in the piece fleece. It's just, it's just it is still a rustic feeling yarn, but it is much softer than the Let Lopi. And the Let Lopi just seemed, I don't know how to explain it, but it just seemed thinner and less full than the Peace Fleece. So I was a little bit worried that it was going to make my color work look wonky. <laughs> I keep using that word wonky because I don't know any other word to describe it, but maybe uneven might be a word that makes sense with color work. Anyways, even when I had completed it, there was no puckering, but I just thought that the Let Lopi looked a little different. And um, I had seen recently on the one of the Instagram posts from Espace Trico that they uh, blocked their fabrics. They blocked their knitted fabrics in very, very hot tap water. So not boiling water, but very, like, very hot tap water. And I wanted to give that a shot because, well, one thing is I am I trust that the ladies from Espacico know what they're doing. They're very knowledgeable. And the other thing was I just really wanted to see how much 
the fabric would bloom. I thought that using the very hot water um, would give it the best chance of really, really blooming. So I did that and I actually have very hot water out of my tap to the point where y you can barely touch it. it. It's that hot. And I filled up a bin. Um, I actually use a small recycling bin clean. It's never been used for recycling, but I had picked it up at Canadian Tire for very inexpensive price and just seems to be the exact perfect size for blocking sweaters or shawls or other garments. I just love it. It's not too big. It's not too small. Anyways, I filled it up with very hot water and I also put in some wool wash and I don't know where I got this wool wash. I think I got it from an indie dyer, but if I did, I can't remember who it was or I may have got it at a fiber festival. I'm not 100% sure. But anyways, it's called Sweetgrass. And it smells so good. Anyways, usually you only put a capful in, but I think I put three capfuls in to the water. And then I put the sweater in and I let it sit there until probably took about four hours until the water had reached just room temperature. It was just tepid. It wasn't cold, it wasn't, there was no remaining warmth left. It was just exactly room temperature. It might have actually felt a tiny bit cool because because we keep our house on the cool side. So I did that and then I laid it out on my blocking mats, but I didn't pin it at all because again, um, I didn't want it to stretch at all and the color work didn't need any stretching as far as I was concerned. So I just laid it out. Um, it took about 48 hours to dry because I turned it over on the second day and it was still damp. And then the following day I turned it inside out. So it was around 48 hours to completely dry. But I am in love with how much this yarn bloomed and the let lopi as well the let lopi completely filled out um it softened and filled out all the kind of spaces that i was worried about in the color work um it completely fits in it doesn't look like a different yarn it doesn't look out of place and this is so soft and it's got like a halo now that it didn't have before. And I am wearing it right now with a shirt underneath, but that's more, it's definitely for me, it's next to skin soft. I could wear this without a sweater underneath. My issue is that it's, as I said, the sweater's kind of large on me. So I like to layer something underneath the sweater so that's that's the reason why I have that's the reason why I have a, a long sleeve t-shirt underneath because it's completely not necessary I just like to layer so I would always wear a t-shirt underneath that's just me so anyways that's my first finished object I know I had a, a lot to say about that but I'm just in love with it and I could wear it every day we still have snow here in Northern Ontario. So actually it's the time of year where I could throw this sweater on um, with a, a, a long sleeve t-shirt underneath and just a pair of jeans and um, go outside. Anywhere between like zero up to, you know, plus 10, plus 12. Um, this would be almost like a coat. It would, it's just so warm and snuggly and I'm so, I'm in love with it. So another okay. finished object that I have is this cape. This is called the October Cape. I decided to knit uh, this particular item. Well, for one thing, I just wanted something that 
was kind of springy. Um, as much as I love this sweater, I, I, I wanted some light colors and just something that made me think of spring. And I was on a Zoom call with a bunch of ladies. Um, I'm part of the Creative Knitters for the Knit Collage group. And we were on a Zoom call and one of the ladies on the call had on this beautiful, I, I couldn't tell what it was. I couldn't tell if it was a shawl. Anyways, it was gorgeous and I had to ask her what the pattern was and she said it was the October Cape. Um, the pattern is by Shayna Billows and it's on Ravelry and I will link it below and I will link everything below that I talk about. So everything I talked about with this sweater and everything I, I will talk about, I will link it below. So this is just a little cape that you can throw on if you're chilly. It's super easy. It, you just basically cast on and then knit in the round. And then at the bottom, it's got this sweet little garter stitch border. And then you cast off. I mean, it couldn't be easier. It's a great pattern for a new knitter. I knit this with my, so my favorite needles to knit with are, I have a set of Chagu interchangeables. I have this small set. I'm all over the place with this. What I wanted to say, I forgot all about it as I was talking. So what I wanted to say was that I used my Knitter's Pride bamboo interchangeable needles to knit this which was totally fine but they're not as sharp as chowgu so when you are knit after you do your increase and you there are spots where you have to knit through the back loop it was just a little bit challenging to get the bamboo needle to easily glide through the back loop because it's just not as sharp as the uh, metal needles or chagu needles that I, I like. But it's, it wasn't horrible. I just had to put my finger there to hold the yarn down and I kind of got into a rhythm with it. I didn't gauge swatch again. You know, I keep saying I didn't gauge swatch, but I actually do believe in gauge swatching. Just not for something like a shawl or a capelet like this, because I don't think it's crucial I don't think the size is crucial. Now, having said that, I misread the pattern and I cast on the small size. I just continued, I didn't rip back and I just adjusted so that um, I added more increases gradually so that eventually I was at the large size. So I think there's only two sizes, uh, small, medium and large, extra large. And I was trying to knit the large, extra large and I cast on the small medium. There's no, you just cast on, there's no uh, ribbing or anything like that. So as you can see, the top just kind of rolls down. So that's kind of cute. And again, it's just, um, anyways, the yarn is a fingering weight yarn held double with a mohair. And I didn't have any yarn in my stash that I thought was appropriate for this project. Um, I really wanted something springy and speckly and fresh colors. Uh, the, the mohair is satin is garn tin mohair um, and that in white. So I have that here. So this is actually my third skein of the mohair. I I really just had had to start using it down here at the bottom um, where the uh, garter stitch started. I had to break into my third skein, which was fine. And then, so this is the fingering weight yarn that I ordered from an Etsy independent dyer. I'm going to hold this up close and I'm hoping it will 
really um, focused so that you can see all the really pretty colors. There's like an aqua color and bright pops of yellow and then splashes of pink on a, a creamy base. There's some minty green in there. It's just really beautiful yarn. And yes, I got it off Etsy. So I went looking for a particular, I was actually looking for lavender with sprinkles of color. And I found this and I like this even more. So this yarn is from the Woolen Frog. It's called Aqua Sprinkles. It's a fingering weight 8020 superwash three ply. And there's 400 and it's 115 grams. You get 430 meters. So I ordered two skeins of this because the pattern called for 540 meters. I, I, I haven't weighed this, but I still have almost a full skein of this second um, skein, but I, I have a project that I think it will fit in very well. So I'll talk about that in a moment. So when I tried it on, and hopefully I can insert some pictures, I didn't mind this rolled top, but I really wish, it's my own fault for not casting on the correct number of stitches, but I really wish that the opening was wider. I think for me, it would look nicer for my body type and, and all of that. So I am considering folding this over on the inside and stitching it down. And I may get more use out of it if it's like that. And again, I hope that I can um, insert some pictures so that you can see it, but it would make a wider neck. And um, I, I think that that would look better on me, but let me know in the comments, should I just keep the roll top? like this, or should I stitch it down and kind of open it wider? Also, I did not alternate skeins, even though I did think that when I compared the two skeins of yarn, one did seem to be more highly speckled with pink than the other one. Um, but I didn't feel like alternating skeins, even though it was such a simple project. I, I just didn't Basically, I didn't care, <laughs> and I still don't care if one was more speckled than the other for this type of project. If it was a sweater or something like that, but this only took me a few days to do, and it was very, um, I basically binge watch Bridgerton for a few days while I knit this. So because I didn't alternate skeins you can see that the top part does the top this this top part is the first skein of yarn and then you can see where i changed skeins because it's it definitely has uh more more pink on the bottom part but you know what i see <laughs> I don't care. I don't think anybody would notice that. And I think it looks intentional. Um, there's a bit of a story behind why I cast this on as well. Just, <laughs> I really wanted something simple that I could knit around and around with some very simple increases. Um, because on March 25th, uh, I went in for surgery and it's nothing serious. I'm fine. I am still recovering. So there's that. But um, 
The surgery was um, a little nerve wracking for me. Uh, I did require general anesthetic. I was under for 90 minutes to two hours. Um, I was having some abdominal surgery. I won't go, I won't bore you with the details of it, but because the COVID protocols are still in place, what that means is unless you need a caretaker, you have to go into the hospital alone and you have to register and then wait in the waiting area for about two hours um, until they bring you in and start prepping you for the surgery. So knowing that, I spoke to the nurse ahead of time, knowing that I was going to be sitting alone, all I could think of was that I really needed some knitting that I could do, nothing complicated, but something very rhythmic, something very meditative to calm my nerves uh, before the surgery. And I was extremely glad. So I actually cast this on that morning. And that might be part of the reason why I cast on the wrong number of stitches. Um, because I, I did have a case of the nerves going in that day. So anyways, I don't remember how much I got done in that space of time. And it didn't, I didn't end up being there for the full two hours. They, they took me earlier than that. So that was good. But anyways, the October Cape by Shana Billows. Fun project. I hope to insert some pictures. Hopefully I have inserted some pictures so that you can see what it looks like on. Super soft and fluffy. Just fun. Fun knit, easy knit. Um, would definitely recommend this for a beginner knitter. You could get something done really quick. Super easy. So I'm not done. I have a few other finished objects to share with you. So the first one is a test knit. It, uh, the test knit was for a pair of lace socks. I don't have them with me, so I'm going to have to insert some pictures as I'm talking about them. So this was a test knit for Emma Barnaby of Tiny Desk Knitting. And if you haven't watched Tiny Desk Knitting, it's a really informative um, podcast, especially if you are interested in color work. So if you're at all interested in color work, uh, I highly recommend watching Emma. She's very knowledgeable. I think in the last podcast I showed them to you, but I was just at the very beginning, possibly even had just cast on the ribbing. Um, so I knit the socks Magic Loop on 1.5 US 2.5 millimeter needles. I cast on 64 stitches. And I did 20 rounds of two by two ribbing. And then I put in two rounds of plain stockinette before I started the lace pattern. I just didn't want to confuse myself uh, after the ribbing. So I did the two rounds of stockinette. So the um, yarn I used was Malabrigo Sock which is a 100% superwash merino in the Ceriza colorway. Now, because this is 100% superwash merino, I do not feel confident that these socks will really hold up that well. Um, my daughter claimed the socks immediately, actually before they were even finished, she claimed them. Uh, which caused me to have to um, do a rap very rapid toe decrease because uh, I originally was knitting them for myself and her foot's a little bit smaller than mine is. So I did 15 pattern repeats of the lace. 
and then I um, Kitchener stitched the toes closed. I finished those socks on February 22nd and I had 40 grams left of the sock yarn um, out of a 100 gram ball. So um, I did a heel flop and gusset with a slip stitch heel. Emma includes instructions for an eye of partridge heel if um, you want to do that and it actually looks really pretty on the lace socks um, as other testers did it and I thought it looked really good. Anyways, that was a very enjoyable test knit. <clears throat> when we signed up for the test knit for Emma, she had a place where you could indicate if you wanted to test knit all 12 pairs of socks and I indicated that I did. So we are currently into the test knitting for the second pair of socks and I will show you that in the whip section because that's what I'm working on now. So Emma has a theme or, yeah, I guess you could call it a theme. She has a theme for her sock patterns, which is like a Jane Austen theme. So the first pair of socks were inspired by Jane Bennett, who is the oldest sister in Pride and Prejudice. And this month's is Kitty Bennett. And again, I will talk more about that um, in the whip section. So these socks are some vanilla shorties that I cast on for myself. These are uh, knit in a luxury alpaca yarn that I wanted to try. I forget the colorway off the top of my head, but it this colorway reminds me of corn. I don't know why it's got some like white and then it's got a, a yellow color that's like a corn I don't know it reminds me of cream corn anyways I like it I like this color I chose it so I do like it so the yarn said fingering weight so I used I did I knit the socks cuff down using a US 1.5, uh, 2.5, a US 1.5, uh, 2.5 millimeter needle uh, on a 40 inch cord. So I did it magic loop and I cast on 64 stitches. And then I did 20 rounds of two by two rib, but then on the top of the foot, I just kept going with the two by two rib because I wanted to make sure that the um, sock was nice and squishy and would form to my foot. I did a heel flap and gusset with a slip stitch heel. And I have to say that even though the yarn said fingering on it, it's not a fingering weight yarn. So I should have recognized that. Um, and I should have went up a needle size. So doing it on the US 1.5. Well, first of all, I didn't need to cast on 64 stitches. And so this part is a little bit looser on my ankle than I would like. So I could have, I think, cast on 60 inches, sorry, cast on 60 stitches for this part. And then, um, I think the socks would have fit better. They fit okay and I really like them and they're really, they've got both a rustic feel but also soft. The alpaca yarn ha has a rustic feel but also soft too and they're very warm. I, um, I just did a wedge toe and closed it with Kitchener Stitch. Um, my doing this, trying to do the slip stitch heel with a 1.5 needle 
with such a thick yarn was really hard on my hands. So that's the second time. Like, I think I've learned my lesson. So this part, this part of the sweater, the, so the collar part of the sweater, I knit a very thick yarn on a small gauge needle and it hurt my hands. And then on this yarn, again, um, I think it's like a sport weight yarn. I knit it for a fingering weight needle. And this part doing the slip stitch heel just was very painful on my hands. It was just very difficult. So I think I've learned my lesson with those two projects not to try and use a smaller needle. Um, you end up with a very dense fabric, which I think will be good for the bottom of the socks. I think that dense fabric will uh, make the socks last longer, but uh, it was a learning experience for sure. So anyways, there are some socks for me and that makes me happy. So these are the Selena socks. These were a test knit for Nicole from the Professor Pearl podcast. This is her first pattern and I was super happy to test be part of the test knit group for these. Um, Nicole is a very engaging and inclusive designer so she really um, makes the testing process fun and um, it's just a very warm and welcoming environment. So everybody feels comfortable sharing and um, it was a great experience for sure. So you may have seen these on Instagram if you follow me on Instagram. Again, these are the Selena socks. I think I'm pronouncing that right. They uh, I'm, so the pattern is written for a DK weight sock or a fingering weight held double with mohair. So these are meant to be like a house sock, I think, or, um, you know, if you want to slip some cozy socks on while you're watching Netflix or reading a book, these would be the perfect socks for that. So with that in mind, I knit mine in cashmere <laughs> so you might think I'm crazy to knit socks in cashmere but hear me out um first of all these socks are for a very special person and um I can't wait to give them to her they um again they're knit in cashmere however the cashmere is reclaimed cashmere so I bought the cashmere from a person who buys vintage garments or um, thrifted garments. And if um, the material that the garment is made out of is a great material, but the garment has other issues, um, perhaps it has a hole in it or um, it's so out of style that nobody's interested in it. Um, she will frog the garment and recondition the yarn and then sell it uh, wound into cakes. And she tells you how many yards and meters are in the cake and um, how, like, how many grams you're getting. Extremely reasonably priced. You only live once. So yes, I made socks out of cashmere. And they're a beautiful dusty, like purple, uh, dusty plummy color too that I just absolutely love. So this pattern is really interesting. It's a very, um, it makes this interesting pattern, but it's a, it's, a, it's a two row repeat and just a four stitch repeat for each row. So it doesn't take long before you just get into this really mellow, rhythmic, repetitive, oh, just such a joy to knit. And they look complicated, but they're they're not. So anybody really could knit these. 
something I learned during this test, test it was how to do a Dutch heel. So um, the heel on these socks are square instead of wedge shaped. So a square heel is more like your actual heel than a wedge shape. So for some people, that's going to actually make a better fit. So um, I was really happy to learn a new heel and it was so easy. Her instructions that she laid out, you just follow them and all of a sudden you have a Dutch heel, like you have a square heel instead of a, it was just crazy for me. I always find doing, doing a heel flop and gusset though and the, the heel turn, I always find that a magical process each time I do it. I'm like, oh my goodness, you just knit a few stitches, you turn around, you go the other way and all of a sudden, you know, you have, <laughs> you have socks. Like it's just, to me, it's, it's, it'll, I don't think I'll ever not find it magical. Anyways, the pattern is released. Um, it was released a few days ago. Uh, highly recommend um, if you want a nice, warm, fuzzy pair of socks in fingering and mohair, go get the pattern. You, you won't be disappointed. So for the pattern design of the Selena socks, Nicole also had a literary inspiration, which is really interesting. So both of the test knits that I completed uh, the designers had literary inspirations for their socks. I find that very interesting. Um, so Nicole's inspiration was Selena, who is the main character from Throne of Glass. So I thought I should read the book. She's extremely enthusiastic about this book series and I had never read it. So I checked out the book from the library and I have started reading it. I haven't finished. I'm only a few chapters in. Um, I have several books on the go. That's how I usually operate. But so far I'm enjoying it and I haven't even really got to the main uh, part of the plot, I don't think. But so far it's interesting and I'm always happy to be introduced to a new book series. So there's that. Okay, so those are all of my finished objects. I have one whip. So these are the Kitty Bennett socks. You can see I have just started on the ribbing. So what I have done, and I hope Hope I don't regret this is I am knitting the socks two at a time but not on the same needles so what I'm doing is one of the socks I'm knitting from the outside of the skein and one of the socks I am knitting from the center of the skein now that's not something I think, I don't think you can do that uh, if you are knitting two at a time socks on the same needles, but I am not on the same needles. So again, um, Emma said that we could do whatever, we could knit toe up, we could knit cup down, we could do whatever um, ribbing we wanted whatever heels we wanted, whatever toes, her only stipulation. She's very easygoing, um, really good to test it for. Her only stipulation was that we, we do the lace pattern to test and make sure that it works properly. So right now I just have um, two by two ribbing. Um, that one is completed and I'm on a 1.5, US 1.5, 2.5 millimeter needle and I think that is a 30 yes that's a 32 inch needle and then on this one um, I don't know how many I have so far but it's it's not completed and it, it's obviously or it's the same um, needle size as the other one although I believe this one's a 40 inch loop and these needles have a bit of a curve in them. They're both chagu 
but these ones have a curve in them that I find irritating. But anyways, it's still fine. It's just a, it's just a little bit annoying sometimes. Anyways, I've only just started. That's my one whip. So just to talk about how all of these projects play into my make nine for the year and my goal to be uh, more of a monogamous knitter. I think for the most part, I think for the most part, I have kept to the goal of being a monogamous knitter. Um, I have had socks and one other item on the go. However, the socks are great for um, car knitting or, you know, being able to just grab the project and, and do it anywhere. So I, I feel like just having two projects is not too bad. I, I worked on this one uh, primarily and then the socks were kind of in the background and I didn't start the October Cape until this sweater was complete. Um, so I feel like I am kind of reaching my goals towards being more of a monogamous knitter, if not a completely monogamous knitter. The other thing I wanted to do was knit from stash. I think I'm failing miserably at that goal. Um, this was all knit from stash, but only in so far as I obtained the yarns for the project in 2021. So yes, they were bought in 2021, not 2022, but, and technically I guess that stash, but it didn't feel like I was accomplishing my goal. Um, the October Cape, that was completely new yarn. I did look through my stash for something appropriate, but I didn't find what I was looking for. Um, the Luxury Alpaca Socks, the Vanilla Shorties, those were, uh, I ordered that yarn. That was not from my stash. The Selena Socks in Cashmere, the Cashmere was ordered not, <laughs> and it wasn't ordered alone. There was other yarn in that delivery, um, other cashmere yarn, and also some fingering weight uh, wool and camel that I was interested in trying because I've never knit with camel yarn before. So that's why I included that. I don't know if that's a good enough reason or not. Insofar as my make nine projects i if you recall or if you'd watched that video uh if you haven't i can link it above it'll be in the top right hand corner the link for that but my goal for my, i had two make nine boards one was for whips that i was carrying over from 2021 and one was for brand new projects the great news is this project was on my make nine board. So that is one that I can cross off happily. And then of course I had frogged my shawlography. So that one is going to come off as well. The October Cape, <laughs> the October Cape was not on my make nine it wasn't on either of my make nine boards but that's okay and all of these socks were not on my make nine board but again that's totally fine so earlier i had mentioned that i thought the barber cords were a game changer and i kind of wanted to talk about game changers i have heard a few other podcasters talk about um, knitting game changers, which got me thinking to, well, what are my knitting game changers? Um, what types of things have really just completely made a huge difference in what I do and how I do it? So the barber cords are absolutely on that list. 
something else that I want to show you that's on the list. And I have showed you these before. Be, um, they, what I'm about to show you came in my advent calendar, uh, 2021 advent calendar from Twice Sheared Sheep. And I got a bunch of these in different sizes. And I was happy to get them when I got them. But now I am thrilled with this particular tool. And I use these all the time. Um, I'm just, if I lose them, I'm going to be very upset. And I will immediately order more because I, I now don't think I can... <laughs> knit properly without them so after that huge so the first one are these row counters so these are just what they just what I said they are, they're row counters. And I have been using them particularly for socks. Um, most garments or a lot of the garments that I have knit, they're, they're, they are um, measured in inches rather than the number of rows. So unless I'm doing cuffs, and I want to make sure the cuffs match equally. In that case, I'll use the row counters because I want to make sure I'm doing the exact same number of stitches. Um, it's so simple to use. And the thing, okay, so this could be just me. It may not apply to you. So you may not be as excited about this tool but I have a hard time keeping track of my rows. I have tried different techniques. I have tried um, using um, apps to do it. I have physical row counters that you just press each time you go around. And I have tried just putting a scratch on a pad, right? So keeping track of it that way. My problem is I get distracted by podcasts that I'm watching, news that I'm listening to, something that's going on in the house, a conversation I'm having with my husband. I get distracted. I'm still knitting, but I'm distracted by all those other things. And what ends up happening is I will go past the beginning of round marker and then I look down and I can't remember if I clicked the button or pressed the app or put a scratch. It's gone. It's completely gone. Like I, I can't remember at all. Did I do that last round? Did I do it this round? If you have these on where the beginning of round marker is or instead of the beginning of round marker, you can't help but stop every time you get to this and change it. You don't need to think about, did I do it? You have to stop and do it because just the design of it makes you do that. And then it also has, if you need to count like a lot of rows, like 50 rows, it also has a little clip that you can move uh, for the 10 spot. I guess I wanna say from old math terms. So you could start at the top and then move it down and know like if it's on the three, and, um, you know, you, you know, you're in the thirties as you're moving down. So it's got that little clip. I haven't really used that. Um, I haven't needed to, um, count that many rows, but it would come in handy if I did. So there's this, but also they sent these and at the time, I didn't know if I would use these, but now they're like, I can't not use these. So here it is.
One says KI, and that stands for knit increase. And one says KD, and that stands for knit decrease. So anytime you are doing a round of knit increase or a round of knit decrease, and there's so many patterns that have that, you just use these and you don't need to remember if you're on a knit round or an increase round or a decrease round. Because again, these make you stop and change them over. So you just need to look at it. Um, they're really good for uh, toe decreases, for example. That's just one of the times that I've used it. What I love about these and the numbers, the row counter, is that you can put your knitting down. Like if the whistle starts blowing for your tea and you have to just drop your knitting and then you go to make your tea and you walk away and then you get distracted and when you come back, you're gonna know exactly where you are. It tells you exactly where you are. You don't need to remember it. You don't need to try and think, where was I? What row am I on? Am I doing a decrease? Okay, these are a game changer. Highly recommend. I got mine from Twice Sheer Cheap. Um, I do believe they're also available on Etsy. You could make them. You could buy the, the little pieces and from Amazon probably or uh, Michaels and you could make these if you wanted to. Game changer. <clears throat> the other game changer for me is Knit Companion. I'm not sponsored by Knit Companion, but when I started using the app knit companion it completely changed everything for me um i'm it's simple to use it doesn't cost anything there's a really great tutorial by stacy of very pink knits on how to use it the it's <laughs> it's so easy and straightforward at the click of a button you can move a pattern from your library on Ravelry right into the app and it opens as a project and you name your project and then you can easily move between pages um, it has a highlighter bar that you can move up and down and a bar that you can move side to side and that makes it very easy to keep track of exactly where you are, whether you're reading the line of a pattern and you want to put the highlighter bar there and then you can move the other bar across as you read your pattern or you can use it for a chart. So easy to use. Um, I highly recommend at least giving it a try even if you're a dyed in the wool paper person, um, this is just excellent. Now, having said that, I have a very large iPad. It's an iPad Pro, so the screen is quite large. So that makes it easy for me to use Knit Companion and to be able to see things very easily. Um, that's one caveat. The second is that even though I think that the unpaid app has a lot of great features and is definitely worth using, I went ahead and paid for the app because I wanted the additional features. Um, I wanted to be able to write on the pattern and, and different use different tools like that. Um, so I went ahead and paid for it and I'm really enjoying using it and I think um, I need to go and look at um, Stacy's tutorial again now that I've purchased the pattern just so she can walk me through those additional uh, features and make sure I'm using it to um, the highest extent possible. Excellent game changer. So those are my three game changers. Knit Companion, those row counters that force you to change the number each time you go around, and also um, the barber cords or the pony cords, whichever ones you use. Um, all three of those are complete game changers for me and I highly recommend. So moving on to acquisitions, one thing that I did buy 
and I bought it off of Amazon because I priced it and there was an $80 difference between buying it from online from a store and buying it from Amazon. Normally I prefer to support yarn stores, but that big of a difference, I just couldn't turn it down. Um, I don't think I would have even ordered it at the higher price. Um, so I love Chalgu and I had seen on Lisa's podcast, Knit All the Yarn, which I watch weekly, love it. Um, she had got a set of Chalgu and she said that the shorties uh, just made knitting sleeves so much easier and quicker just go around and around i don't mind i did these sleeves magic loop and i don't mind knitting magic loop um but it takes a long time you get stuck on sleeve island and i just thought that this would be a good purchase to have especially as the price seemed to be a really excellent price i thought i would pick them up now so i did get these um i was surprised how small it is I didn't realize the whole thing was this small. And it comes with um, two and three inch tips. Um, from a US four to a US eight. And comes with just a couple of the, uh, the small cords, three, co three cords twist flex cables, um, five inch, six inch, and eight inch. So that should cover most sleeves. And I'm excited to try those. So I'm happy with that. Also, so I got these two books that I wanted to share with you. The first one is called, this was on sale on Amazon. Again, I need to probably stay off of Amazon, but this is called Knit Two Socks in One, Discover the Easy Magic of Turning One Long Sock into a Pair. And this is by Sophia Tally, who has a website called thedrunkknitter.com. So I'll show you this. So this is another way of doing socks where you basically knit one long sock. It's similar to cranking a two. It has 21 designs in here and it explains what kind of fiber is the best for socks. And then it has different designs at different weights. And it's got step-by-step -step instructions for adding the uh, lifeline stitches and, and cutting in, which I really need, and then how to add in the uh, heels and toes. So I'm excited to try this technique. I always like, I always enjoy trying different techniques. As I said earlier, um, the Dutch heel was new to me and I really liked learning that. Sorry, I'm, I'm looking at the designs while I'm talking to you because I am excited to try this. So that's one book that I got and like I said it was on sale so I can't remember what I paid for it but it was a really good price. And then this one I bought from a yarn store. This is called Wilderness Knits. I'm sure you have seen it before. Every time I see this cover picture come up, um, whether it's in a magazine or um, online, I swoon because I think this is absolutely gorgeous. So this is Wilderness Knits by Linka Newman. She is on Instagram and it's Scandi style sweaters for adventuring outdoors. So this book not only 
and I'm going to flip through it as I'm talking again. This book not only gives you the most amazing sweater patterns, it also has these gorgeous photos that make you want to be like an outdoor adventurer in Iceland or some other Nordic country. They're just, the patterns are amazing. So this is an example of what I'm talking about. Move it back. I'm not sure what you can see or not see. So there are 23 patterns in this book. And I am not exaggerating when I say I want to knit and wear every pattern and I want to go dog sledding and I want to go climb rock climbing. I want to go rock climbing. I want to have a fire outdoors in the winter. Okay, I want to be these people. I want to be these people. So gorgeous. I need to knit every sweater in here. So none of these sweaters are on my make nine. I do have a sweater and it's like I said, I don't have to stay on my make nine. I can veer off, but I don't have to. It's my make nine. So I can do what I want with it. Um, but I do have one sweater on my Make 9 called the Maya Cardigan. And I do have most of the yarn to make that um, cardigan. I was going to use Let Lopi for that. And I'm just wondering if I might uh, take that Let Lopi now. And instead of making the Maya Cardigan, if I could maybe make one of these sweaters instead. Just because I'm feeling passionate about this book right now and I mean the Maya cardigan will always be there it's not I, I love the Maya cardigan um and I can always go buy more yarn and make the Maya cardigan um but I think I may steal that yarn and make one of these sweaters we'll see gorgeous projects they're heavy though these are heavy, warm sweaters and we're moving into summer. So I'm just not sure when I want to start making these. It's not if, it's when. Gorgeous. So that's another book that I wanted to share with you. So I have one other thing that I want to share with you. It is Yarny. Um, when I went online to buy this yarn for this project I was on Etsy and what I usually do when I'm on Etsy is I search for something with the filter free shipping because if I can find an item that has free shipping and it suits my needs I'm going to buy the item with free shipping first that's just the way I am um, I still take into consideration the price of the yarn or whatever it is I am looking for. Like I'm not going to buy an item that's way overpriced for what it is and just because it has free shipping. But the first filter I always use is free shipping. I look through that and then if I still can't find what I'm looking for, then I take the filter off and, and then I look for lower, lower price shipping options. So when I, I did find this, this had a uh, free shipping. But then I also found this. So surprisingly, the price for this was excellent and it was free shipping. And it came from Norway. And I was like, wow, free shipping from Norway and the price is so reasonable. So I decided that I could not resist and the reviews were all really good. And I'm interested in making colorway mittens. So this is a pattern for colorway mittens. It comes in the package in English. 
And then there's also yarn. So I'm going to insert some pictures of um, just so you can get a better look at the the yarn and uh, and such. Because it came with a few extra little goodies. So this is Norwegian wool. So that's fun. The uh, company is Fjord Fibers. She hand dyes the yarn and it is 100 grams and it's 350 meters, 80% wool and 20% polyester. And the yarn base, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but it looks like Troll Fjord Sock. So this is a sock yarn and um, the needle size is 2.5 US or 3.5 millimeters. So I'm going to pay attention to that this time and not try and knit on a smaller needle. And these, uh, the pattern, I cannot produce, I cannot pronounce the, uh, the pattern name, but uh, in English, it's little chicken mittens. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little chick coming out of an egg. So anyways, I'm excited about that because I really love the colors of the yellow and the white. I wanted to learn color work mittens. If you recall from my last podcast, I did start some color work mittens. I just, um, I still haven't completed those. I didn't show those today because I haven't done any further work on them beyond what you saw last time. So that's the one yarny thing I wanted to share. I The price was super reasonable. I think it was uh, $35 Canadian and free shipping. So I got the yarn, two skeins of hand dyed yarn, two, uh, the pattern, some treats. So she sent some um, Norwegian treats. I haven't opened that. Um, and even a little wooden, a little wooden progress keeper with a star on it. To me, that's an excellent deal. And well worth it, I think. And I can't wait to knit these mittens. So that's fun. I saw a pattern come up on Ravelry. It It's free to download and I checked today and it's still free. It's called the Coralie Shawl. And what really interested me about the Coralie Shawl is that it's it uses five mini skeins and then a, a full skein. And I thought, oh my goodness, what a perfect way to use mini skeins. So I do have a lot of mini skeins and I don't want to just, I love my mini skeins. I don't want to just use them just to use them. I don't know if that makes sense. I just want to use them in a really intentional way that will show off how amazing they are. So what, when I saw the Coralie shawl and it said it used five mini skeins and then a full skein, I thought of two um, packages of mini skeins that I had bought from Lily and Pine. And one of them I thought might be perfect for this shawl just to make a really fun summery shawl. So I wound up these skeins. So I don't know how well, the, I'm really losing my light in here, so I'm not sure how well these are showing up, but this is a pale, pale yellow. Um, and this is like a very minty green. They're just these lovely summery colors, what I think of as like Easter and spring. And then there are these three speckled 
mini skeins that have varying degrees of pink speckles and aqua. They, they go so well and yellow, they go really well. Well, they're a set, so they go really well with the, uh, the mint and the pale yellow. And then from Lillian Pine, I also have this, which is like this amazing, I don't even, it's like a highlighter pink. I think it's called lipstick. I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, I'll put it down below. But I'm just in love with this. And it, it has to be for a specific thing. Like you, you know, you don't just put this color in anything. <laughs> So these are all fingering weight. So this is my main color. And these are my five mini skeins. I actually had six mini, mini skeins, but the sixth one is exactly this color. So I thought I would leave that out for now because I'll just use this and these five and maybe I can use that pink one for something else. But then when I, and when I completed the October Cape, I realized that this skein could also work with these. Like it's such a summery palette. I just love all these colors together. I hope you can see that. Like how good is that? Anyways, I think this is going to be my next cast on. I'm super excited for that. So I'll have this cast on going along with my Kitty Bennett socks. Those won't take me too long to complete. And hopefully uh, the shawl won't take me too long to complete. The one thing that I don't love about the Coralie shawl is that there's only two pictures and neither of the pictures are held out to get a good view of it. But the pictures are nice. It's just that they show the shawl wrapped up uh, around like a, a mannequin and it, it, the shawl looks beautiful, but I would just really like to see the shawl stretched out to see exactly what it looks like. But I guess we're about to find out. So if you've stuck around this long, I really appreciate it. I um, love making the connections with anybody who takes the time to watch these videos. If you feel inclined to do so, please like and subscribe and I will see you next time. Bye.